We are going to go over the Baroque today, uh, a lecture that I've split into two parts. It's lengthy. It's some of the best art maybe uh, that we have seen uh, in many ways. There's certainly innovations happening here, great artists and innovations and people like Caravaggio. Uh, perhaps, though, what's really important is we are beginning to see that music, opera being developed, the orchestra being developed, and better instruments being developed that is going to continue into the Romantic era. We are seeing where perhaps it could be said that music is becoming a greater art form than painting or sculpture. It is not on the periphery of um, what it can do anymore. And I might even argue that today, that in terms of influence, music is probably better known than contemporary painting and contemporary sculpture and art today. Uh, less people are aware of that than they are maybe of uh, composers like John Williams uh, or uh, pop music, uh, Taylor Swift and other people, right? You, you could say that music is a more predominant form of culture than perhaps art is. And we're seeing that change happening here in the Baroque. So let's get into the beginnings of this. So the Baroque is from 1650 to 1750. The word Baroque is Portuguese and it means crooked pearl. It's characterized by dynamic movement, extravagant ornamentation, and especially theatrical display. And I don't mean theater purely in terms of theater, but in terms of the art having theatrical qualities to it. And we'll see that in Bernini and some other artists as well. So the features begin in the Baroque, earliest in Italy and Spain, associated with the Catholic Reformation, which I'll go over in a couple moments, and also happening in the 1600s in France, where they serve to advertise the opulence and power of the monarchy. The spatial grandeur of Baroque is evident in its literature of the Protestant North and the paintings of the Dutch Golden Age. So we are getting a secular Baroque also that is happening uh, with the Dutch. We are seeing new forms of music in vocal music, opera, and also the rising tide of purely instrumental music, music that is not uh, does not need the voice to have accompaniment in it. And that's because, again, better instruments and more precise uh, making of the instruments is happening. Three phases is what we're going to look at. The Italian Baroque, linked with the fervor of the Counter-Reformation, and the Northern Baroque, typified by Protestant sediment grounded in scripture and fueled by secular ambitions of the Northern Europe's uh, middle class, commercial middle class. And then the Aristotic Baroque, sponsored by the French monarch Louis XIV and widely imitated in the absolutist courts of Europe. So the Catholic Reformation. You didn't think the Catholics were going to sit idly by and let this Northern Reformation take 50% of uh, its money and uh, its uh, congregation and, and just, you know, take it? <laughs> of course not. So the Catholic Reformation uh, is uh, happening in the 1540s to win back Catholicism and those who had strayed from uh, the religion or had become disillusioned. The Reformation is initiated by Pope Paul III in the Council of Trent. In the Council of Trent, we are seeing a, a uh, which happens from 1545 to 1563, the church is making reforms. 
It's confirming all seven of the sacraments, which we studied that the Reformation in various forms, Luther only believes in two of them, and then the Anabaptists are done with all of it. They are revising the actions of the Inquisition and uh, making a list of books that are judged to be uh, uh, heretic, uh, heretical and forbidden to Catholic readers, and they are supporting a broadly based Catholicism that emphasizes direct and intuitive, hence mystical, experiences of God. So they are taking on the Reformation that is getting rid of the priest in favor of the lay clergy and that anyone can be a clergy person simply with knowledge and reading the Bible. Uh, the Catholics are countering that you still need the Pope, you still need the church, you still need the sacraments, but we respect if you have personal dealings with God, if you have visions and other things. And I think this comes out wonderfully in Spanish painting. Uh, I, I think that is really fantastic, where you see kind of a, a, a realistic painting, but then there are clouds and saints hanging out. I particularly love these in Mexican retablos, uh, the ex voto paintings. Ignacio de Loyola. So he is a soldier in the army of King Charles I of Spain, the Holy Roman Emperor, Charles V. He brought Catholicism, the same iron will he exercised on the battlefield. After his leg was fractured by a French cannonball, he became a teacher, a hermit, traveling lame and barefoot to Jerusalem in an effort to convert Muslims to Christianity. It's pretty dangerous stuff. He founds the Society of Jesus, and this becomes the Jesuits. And they are looking for a militant return to the fundamental Catholic dogma, strict enforcement of traditional church teachings. And also, they are reminding monks of celibacy, poverty, and obedience. He took an allegiance, a oath of allegiance to the Pope. And the Jesuit order will become a missionary society of early modern times, rigorously trained and acting as preachers, confessors, and teachers. The Jesuit order has two elements to it, uh, militant religious zeal and also mysticism. The first emphasizing the personal and intuitive experiences, and the second involving the attitude of unquestioned submission to the church as the absolute source for truth. In art, kind of pre-Baroque, pre prefacing the Baroque, really I think we're talking about the emphasis of mannerism that we saw in late Michelangelo, the elongated bodies that we see in the Last Judgment fresco in the Sistine Chapel, those huge long bodies, muscular torsos, and tiny heads. So mannerism is marked by spatial complexity, artificiality and affection. They're bringing psychological intensity rather than mathematical perfection. This Parmigiano is a well-known work in the mannerist style known as the Madonna of the Long Neck. We are looking at an unnaturally elongated Virgin Mary perched above a courtyard, adorned with a column that has no supporting superstructure, spidery-like fingers that touch her chest as she gazes at this oversized Christ child who seems to slip lifelessly off of her lap. Onlookers looking into the space from the left with a small figure on the right, perhaps a prophet, draws our eyes into distant space. Cool coloring and an overall smokiness make the painting even seem more contrived, and yet its very contrivance and unbelievability of space is kind of what's really great about it. El Greco, uh, the, uh, the Greek living and working in Italy and Spain, 
he is in the service of the church and he is producing visionary canvases marked by bold distortions of form, dissonant colors, and daring handling of space. His flame-like figures are often highlighted with ghostly whites and yellow grays and seem to radiate halos of light that symbolize the luminous power of divine revelation. What's also, I think, interesting about El Greco that we see later in Pablo Picasso, another Spanish painter, or a Spanish painter, I said, working uh, in Spain, who would be familiar with El Greco, who is Greek, but also working in Spain. What's interesting about this painting that we're looking at here in the resurrection is notice how there is no real definable perspective in space here. It's as if the background and the foreground have combined and flattened. And that is an element that you'll find consistently in El Greco. So one little thing about Catholic music before we touch on some other things. The Council of Trent, the Council of Trent is also condemning borrowing popular tunes and then putting um, religious lyrics to them. It's also banned complex polyphony that tends to obscure the sacred text. So they are more interested in something closer to maybe plain chant uh, or something that is, um, uh, again, kind of a little bit suspicious of instrumentation or at least instrumentation that is obscuring <coughs> your ability to hear the liturgy. The Spanish Inquisition is established in 1478 by Catherine Monarchs Ferdinand II and Isabella I. It is intended to ensure the supremacy of Catholicism and they are taking people who are heretics and they are using the body to torture people uh, into following the right religion and will maim or kill if they have to. The idea is, is that maiming the body or, or hurting the body is less important than saving the soul. And here again, we see the duality, that Platonic duality that we found in St. Augustine. The idea that the body is profane and the soul is pure. The Italian Baroque. So before the 19th century, Baroque was used to mean grotesque and absurd. It has its roots in the Mannerist era and is also happening in the colonies, uh, the American colonies of Spain. And we are seeing the Baroque kind of forming there with a mixture of kind of some native motifs. So in Italian Baroque architecture, when we look at St. Peter's here and the construction of the huge dome of Michelangelo's design completed in 1590, we have also a new piazza in the front. And the piazza is designed by sculpture, sculptor Gian Lorenzo Bernini. And Bernini is maybe, God, I don't know, maybe a better sculptor than Michelangelo. That could be up for debate. I kind of go back and forth on this myself. He is creating this key shape in the piazza and he is incorporating a spectacular colonnade of 284 Greek-style Doric columns and 96 sculpted saints. It is massive and can hold 250,000 people. Also, St. Peter's Baldachin is designed by Bernini. The Baldachin is an immense bronze canopy that covers the high altar in St. Peter's and also is marking the point where they believe that St. Peter is buried.
San Carlo, Quattro Fontaine. Let me show you a little bit of this here. I didn't have this queued up. So I think that the Khan Academy Smart Art, they have some really, really great videos. And when you're looking for good videos on art, you're always looking for what are their credentials and who's sponsoring them. You never want to take anything too serious on the internet that doesn't have citations or isn't published by a reputable source. So here, I love their intro piano music. We're, We're going to see a little bit about San Carlo. San Carlo at the Four Fountains in Rome. This magnificent, tiny church designed by the Baroque architect Borromini. This church is so unexpected when you walk inside. The walls move in and out. They undulate. Everything is about movement in this church. Every architectural form seems to move. The rhythms created by the columns seem at such odds with the sense of stability that architecture generally tries to express. You have these engaged columns alternating with niches, and we see curving rectangular panels and arches, and all of this draws our eye up to this amazing dome. But it's not the kind of dome we expect. It's not a perfect hemisphere. It's an oval, and the church itself is based on an oval, which you don't immediately recognize when you walk in. Ormini received this commission from the Trinitarian. Okay. So first of all, we are looking at a building and architecture that is not interested in the geometric clarity that we were seeing in the Renaissance. The other thing we're seeing here is stucco, and we're going to see a lot of stucco throughout the Baroque. So stucco is a type of plaster cement that can be molded very easily, but it kind of looks like marble or looks like something that's carved, but is, in, is cast in liquefied form and is fairly cheap and fairly easy to form. And that is what's creating all of these exceptional decorations in here. As we're looking at the floor plan of San Carlo, you'll notice the two circles that create an oval that are fitting into the equilateral triangles. There is spatial complexity that you always find in the Baroque that we were seeing also in mannerism in terms of spatial confusion. So very often, because the Baroque and then later the Rococo is happening in cities, there's limited space. So making the space look bigger is always something that is pretty important. Um, That's all. It's a good video. I have a link to it. And again, you might want to check my links out here. Uh, you know, you, this, I'm giving you lectures in an expedited way. And I could spend hours, if not days, on these, and we could really sift through lots of materials. But I am giving you the PDFs that hopefully you're not only reading in the class, but you're also perhaps downloading uh, and maybe uh, checking out at least some of the links. So David by Bernini. We looked at this at the end of the Renaissance lecture in uh, the Italian Renaissance, where Bernini is a life-size David, like Michelangelo, but rather than being more classical and still in contraposto, classical Greek in terms of no motion in the face, we are seeing a sculpture rugged and spirited, muscles straining with energy, and a fierce, determinated face breaking into the space with athletic vitality. We are looking at David in motion. And that kind of movement is reminiscent of the Hellenistic period in Greek sculpture. Another one of really the masterful um, works of Bernini, maybe, maybe in some ways his greatest work, is The Ecstasy of St. Teresa. So here we are looking at a Spanish mystic, Teresa of Avila. She is in the moment where she is united with God, 
Bernini is depicting her with her head sunk back, her eyes half closed, swooning in ecstatic, almost sexual surrender on a marble cloud that floats in a heavenly space. She is, the, the angel is smiling gently, lifting her bodice, her, her uh, bodice to insert and remove the flaming arrow into her intestines. There is a billowing tense energy. Teresa's body and heavy gown um, swathes her limp body, and the whole thing is theatrical in dimension. So we are seeing a theatrical way of the presentation of the sculpture underneath an invisible window with gilded rods that look like a golden light is shining on this moment. We have colored marble, and then we actually do have real theater boxes here and sculptures of patrons watching this moment, this miracle happen. And so whenever we talk about the theatrical nature of the Baroque, this is an easy way to see it here because it's a literally one-to-one -one relationship with theater rather than, say, the theatrical qualities that we find in San Carlo with uh, all the stucco and the shapes and the undulating um, uh, movement that happens within and without the church. Caravaggio. So a Baroque, Baroque Italian painting. So Caravaggio is a painter who is a new kind of artist who is heightening light and dark for dramatic theatrical. And almost all of his paintings appear like they might be on a stage rather than in real life. He is clearly painting with optics. There are no drawings by Caravaggio. And he is using everyday people. Here we're looking at the calling of St. Matthew. And notice how there's a strong light coming in from the window that is hitting Matthew and the people sitting with Matthew as Jesus is calling from outdoors or from uh, outside of the group in the dark. Now, if you had in real life, if you had light this strong, it would be impossible to have a shadow this dark. The light would kind of expand and it would slowly get darker. So this is an intensification of light and dark, not something real, but something that is making drama, and again, theatrical. What I think is really interesting about the conversion of St. Paul is this. So this is the Apostle St. Paul. We studied him in chapter 4, and we are seeing St. Paul being called by a personal, intuitive moment with God but unlike other paintings where we would see the angels or the clouds or whatever, we are seeing probably the way that this kind of ecstasy looks in real life. Just somebody writhing on the ground, maybe looking insane, and this guy just moving his horse, kind of trying not to step on the guy, and also really blind to the fact that there is this uh, conversion and this touching of the divine that's happening with this guy on the ground. Again, done in the strong lights and the dark darks that Caravaggio, he kind of also invents, we could say, a new kind of style. And he is taking on a lot of genres, like Judith beheading Holofernes, a story about the, um, the Jewish maid Judith uh, killing a Assyrian general, beheading him, and then helping her people to stave off destruction. This, we think, is a self-portrait of Caravaggio, and the blood is not particularly realistic as it's shooting out of his neck. It is, again, much more theatrical. So the Caravishti, the Caravishti, like Artemisia Gentilici, they are followers of Caravaggio in his short life, and they are, again, taking on the style and also subject matter. Here is her version of Judith slaying Holofernes, and in my opinion, it's a more skilled painting. So you can have these debate in art. 
Is it more important to be the originator of the idea or the style or the medium? Or is it more important to be more masterful and creative with the style? And especially the gritty realism here of the beheading. I personally think this appeals to me more as a painter in terms of the craft and the quality of painting to elicit real emotions. Another one of the great images in our textbook, the ceiling of Pozo in the church of St. Ignazio. This is a vision of um, St. Ignatius. He is, of course, um, a, uh, a, um, a saint in the church. And here we are looking at a new kind of ceiling painting that we had seen with Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel. So here is a trompe painting where we are looking not at the ceiling, but what appears to be a long extension of where the ceiling, an illusion of space that's happening here with dramatic foreshortening. We are seeing this cosmic rendering of the impossible physical space and our saint being led into heaven upon his death and a also allegorical corners representing the new stretches of the empires in Europe of Asia, Africa, and then America. And then of course, Europe is represented, the four corners of the earth in a way that are the grounding points for this miraculous ascension. In the Northern Baroque. So in the Northern Baroque, that is happening in, say, in England and Northern Germany and the Netherlands, Protestants are committed to private devotion rather than public ritual. Churches are stripped of ornamentation and their devotionalism is sharing with the Catholic mysticism and a kind of anti-intellectual anti bias. But the patronage is the middle class, not the church. In Great Britain, following the death of Queen Elizabeth and the golden age of the Elizabethan era, that includes Shakespeare that we had studied in uh, chapter 8, the Glorious Revolution in 1688. So in the Glorious Revolution, we are establishing a Bill of Rights and also a Toleration Act. So with civil rights, people are now going to have rights like not being imprisoned without some sort of trial by jury, and then also religion is going to be tolerated and end some of the bloodshed. We get the King James Bible also written in this era. So the, uh, the King James Bible with the Old and New Testament, spiritual fervor, and the Old Testament uh, in Hebrew uh, that is now narrated in English and a narrative vision of the New Testament like Shakespeare. So the Bible written in a kind of theatrical way. John Donne is a, parliamentary, is a parliamentarian. He enters the parliament in 1601. He is a priest of the Church of England. He develops the sermon as a vehicle for philosophic meditation and his language are noted for their extended metaphors or conceits. A conceit is an elaborate metaphor that compares apparently two dissimilar objects or emotion, often for shock and surprise. One of his most famous comparisons is no man is an island. Every man is a piece of a continent, and I am involved in mankind and there is no way to separate me from mankind. So in England, when you would hear the bells of the church not ringing to come to service or that the service is about to happen, but instead that there is a funeral, 
The question is, is when the bell is tolling, who does the bell toll for? And what John Donne says is that the bell tolls for thee. So in other words, when somebody dies, it is a reminding of you and your own mortality. In literature, we have John Milton, a devout Puritan, staunch defender of the anti-royalist cause in Parliament. He is a humanist and a poet. He also is a secretary to the English Council of the State, and he's a defender of religious, political, and intellectual uh, freedoms. He also is defending divorce, and he is writing a epic poem, and the epic poem is 12 books called Paradise Lost from 1667. It is retelling the story of the fall of Adam and Eve, beginning with the activities of the rebellious archangel Satan and culminating in the expulsion of the first parents from paradise. So we are looking at the meaning of evil in a universe created by a benevolent God. We get the explanation to Adam how fallen humans will be restored by Jesus and humankind can achieve a paradise within, even though we are living in the world of the paradise that is lost. It's vast in its intellectual sweep, theatrical in its staging, and has wide-ranging allusions to history and literature. From Christopher Wren, we see a new London that is being built after a devastating fire in 1666 that destroys three quarters of the city. So 13,000 homes are destroyed, 87 parish churches destroyed, and there is an upsurge then to rebuild and maybe even perfect the old with the new. Uh, we've seen this also happen in the United States with the burning of Chicago where in the burning of Chicago in the late 1800s, the city was rebuilt with a lot of money and a centralized plan rather than simply spreading out. And the city is very efficient in terms of public transportation and other things. Also, this is going to be true in Paris in the mid-1800s, where after a uprising, Paris will be destroyed. They will get rid of the winding streets and then build streets that are straight, that go into roundabouts like spokes in a wheel and also are wide enough that they can't be blocked in an uprising and that the military can move through quite quickly. Kind of like the interstate highways in the United States that mostly were built in an effort when we were about to fight World War II and being attacked in World War II in Hawaii that we needed to be able to move tanks quickly through the United States. This is one of the reasons that the federal government spends a lot of money on our interstate highways, is that yes, they are improving transportation and trade, but they are also there if we need them in case of attack. So London becomes a city of extremes, commercial activities, ultimately intrusion of the um, uh, of a corporation, the East India Trading Company, that will uh, be an ipso facto corporate government in India until uh, India expels them, or uh, uh, until the, uh, the corporation doesn't want to pay for it, and they give their authority to the queen and ultimately are expelled. So we also have poverty and wealth, intellectual activity in London. One quarter of Lind London is uh, illiterate. And the efforts to modernize will lead to things like the founder of the Royal Society of London, which we'll be studying in the Enlightenment, and also building St. Paul. Here we're looking at the facade of St. Paul. And what we see in St. Paul is a combination of classic, Gothic, Renaissance, and Baroque features. So we have Corinthian columns. We have a, uh, a dome back here with a, uh, a lantern on top. And we also have 
the kind of undulating spatial quality that we would see in the Baroque facade that is influenced by Michelangelo. 17th century Holland. So in the Netherlands, they have expelled the armies of the Spanish in 1851. They have created a Calvinist Dutch Republic that will later be called Holland. They have commercially active territories. They are making great ships. They have an appreciation for the comforts of home and hearth. And they are also having a preference of portraits and still lifes and landscapes and scenes of everyday life known as genre scenes in painting. This is a golden age of painting for the Dutch. They are also making telescopes and microscopes, perfecting optics. And we are seeing here the interior of a Calvinist church. And again, with the Calvinist church and the reformative church, notice that there are no frescoes or paintings or mosaics. It is about the grandeur of the architecture and about the worship rather than lots of decorations very different than the Italian heritage going back to the Romans and the Greeks of let's have lots of sculpture and lots of decoration. We're also seeing from the Dutch the beginning of capitalism. In other words, the beginning of money used to speculate on whether or not items will gain wealth or will lose wealth. And there are booms and busts that happen in this. One of the most famous is tulipomania, which in 1637, there was speculation on tulips. And some tulips were selling for as much as 10 times the annual income of a skilled craftsman. And ultimately, there will be a bust, and a lot of people are going to lose money. I think one of the more recent busts that we could talk about would be cryptocurrency that had a real mania, and that mania uh, kind of busted a little bit. When we start talking about science and the innovations in science that are happening uh, in uh, London with the Royal Society and the Lunar Society, we also in this era are looking at science from Johann Kepler, a German mathematician, astronomer, and, ast and astrologer. He is finding the new celestial physics, and he is also beginning to look at that the planets are, um, are happening in ellipses, and he is really beginning to take an excursion beyond where Aristotle left us. Aristotle believed that the entire universe revolves around the Earth, and Kepler is beginning to prove otherwise. Also, and he's using a telescope to do this. And then also with Robert Hooke, he is creating the very first book of illustrations of things he's seeing under the microscope. So we are now seeing the world beyond the limits of human vision. And that is forcing us to reconsider the things we thought were truths that go back all the way to the Greeks. This is a flea, by the way. So Dutch still lifes. In Dutch still lifes, we are finding precision, the same precision we might have found in Van Eyck paintings in our last chapter. Uh, obviously, with tulips and the national mania and the growing of flowers, still lifes are a very important genre scene kind or genre of painting. And generally, the uh, the paintings have a very specific kind of symbolic characters and also you will find various insects and animals that are involved in these still lifes that also have symbolic characteristics. I don't have those for this painting exactly in front of me but you can find them very easily in the link here to the Khan Academy page. Dutch landscape painting. So in Dutch landscape painting what you see are giant skies, flat landscapes, and then the conduit between earth and heaven, almost always Protestant churches with the steeple piercing the sky. 
So the separation between these two halves, or maybe two-thirds and one-third here, is the church that is grounded but also is part of the heavens as well. That's a, a very common motif that we will also see later in a Van Gogh painting called Starry Night. In the genre scenes, we find things like people hanging out, people partying, and a lot of these paintings that are representing the five senses of eating and drinking and everything else, uh, I find these paintings often real fun and very, very lively. Two, the two great painters uh, of the Dutch era are Vermeer, and Vermeer is a Dutch artist, Jan Vermeer. He's depicting light, soft glowing atmospheres. He makes small white dots and highlights like melted pearls, and the immediate surroundings have a directness and an intimacy. He is definitely using the camera obscura, which is why most of his paintings are so small. The milkmaid, we are seeing a robust servant occupied with a mundane task. She's pouring milk from a pitcher into a pot that will be mixed with bread and produce a sop for invalids and small children. Her concentration and gentle lighting gives her a kind of stoic, um, maybe even a, a, almost a heroic quality in this everyday event with that soft Dutch light. From Rembrandt. With Rembrandt, we are getting someone who can paint masterfully in every genre, portraiture, landscape, religious art. He is a keen observer of human character. He is reflecting the self-conscious materialism of the age and the middle class. And one of his more lucrative commissions are the group portraits. So here in the group portrait of the, uh, the, the Night Watch or Captain Franz Banning Koch's mustering of his company, we are seeing a local militia. And this local militia, the, the people that are represented in here are based on how much money they gave Rembrandt. So whether they're in the back, we see the whole body or we see just a piece of them is all dependent on cost. We get that spectacular lighting and light and dark from Rembrandt different than Caravaggio, um, maybe closer to the Venetian artist Titian uh, rather than Caravaggio and, and really great at what he does. So in this painting, we are seeing the militia they are gathering there is a goblet and chicken feet, the company emblem. It looks as if it's on a stage and all brought together by diagonal lances and guns. His self-portraits, though, are probably some of the best self-portraits ever made. In his self-portraits, we are seeing him painting thickly with a palette knife, not with a brush, scraping on pure pigment and scraping it off. His paintings show psychologically probing uh, himself in unprecedented ways before we get into the 1700s. We see slackened facial muscles. We see a furrowed brow. We see someone who is noble and vulnerable at the same time with this rich, thick impasto and emphasis on light and dark and texture. Second part of our lecture, the Aristotic Baroque, exemplified by Louis the Fourteenth. So, this Baroque is measured in the Western European courts of the absolute rulers, maybe the most powerful kings in European history. King Louis XIV is going to reign for nearly 75 years. He's going to dictate the political, economic, and cultural policies of his country. He is going to build a vast palatial estate that he's going to run the government from this estate, not in the city. He says that I am the state. And then 
there's a good argument to be made that the amount of money that he is spending on starting art schools and funding art and music and dance and again his own uh, wealthy estates that he is basically bankrupting France and the future kings King Louis the 16th it's all gonna end with the beheading of the king and his court and his queen and the beginning then of the French Republic so I love this painting of Louis here. He clearly is a little bit older at this time in his life. He is, uh, he has a darkened wig on, he has fancy robes, and man is he showing some leg uh, in his stockings. And why is a king so interested in showing us his legs? Well, part of it is because he is a great dancer and he is also a innovator in ballet. So the kind of ballet that Louis is, and here we see Louis as a younger man dressed in the costume as the Sun King, which was also his nickname. He is inventing dance moves. He is also funding the Academies of Painting and Sculpture, the Academy of Dance, the Academy of Sciences, the Academy of Music, and the Academy of Architecture. So what does this really mean? This means the state is now involved in saying what good art is, saying what's important, and funding it, and hiring professors, and making sure that students are learning how to make the acceptable art of the state as well. In the Palace of Versailles, his great country palace, we are seeing a new revival happening called Neoclassicism. So the classical style and the subject matter of the Greek and Romans and the Roman myths and stories are an ingredient in France's Aristotic Baroque style. And we are going to look more at Neoclassicism in the Enlightenment, but we are definitely seeing it um, being innovated in Louis XIV's time period. In Versailles, we have a extensive palace, and you're going to be looking at the whole palace in our discussion assignment. We have the Hall of Mirrors with, again, painted ceilings, as we've been seeing, uh, also gilding everywhere, stucco everywhere. There is no minimalism in the Baroque. And then outside windows reflected in mirrors, creating again an illusion of space. This is the hallway from King Louis's bedroom into his private chapel. Outside, we are seeing the gardens of Versailles that are done in the Roman style with lots of geometric shapes. Notice the geometry that you see throughout here. And of course, rigorous symmetry also relating to classicism. One of the important painters for Louis and one of the professors in the school in the Academy of Painting and Sculpture, we find Nicolas Poussin. He is the leading painter of the classical French Baroque style. Most of his work is characterized by clarity, logic, and order. He favors line over color. And most paintings are history paintings, where we see here Arcadian shepherds in a pastoral scene, and the uh, shepherds are recognizing a tomb of a companion. We get the muse of history. We get three shepherds. We get writing that we find on the tomb that says, in death I also dwell in Arcadia, and, of course, uh, geometry and idealized figures rather than the elongations in mannerism that we were seeing. So the Academy of Painting and Sculpture is formalizing the rules of painting. Who are they influenced by? Well, the painting looks like a Raphael, doesn't it? And yes, that is exactly who they are trying to copy and they are heralding and they are imitating are the paintings of Raphael. 
They are painting miraculous events, heroic actions, and elevating these subjects with Christian and classical culture. And the subject matter is presented clearly and evenly and harmonious, free of any non-necessary or sordid details. It's about restraint and moderation. That is the decorum in pictorial representations. Peter Paul Rubens. So with Rubens, we have a Flemish painter um, with a great establishment of his reputation, uh, traveling widely as a diplomat and an art dealer to royal patrons in Italy, England, and France. He is working in, again, a kind of confusing space rather than the clear space we just saw with Poussin. And he is painting especially known for his very, very fleshy figures. So when you see his paintings, especially his nudes and his nude women, you are seeing a celebration of the flesh. And I think that that's kind of often uh, maybe what's great in his paintings. Now, of course, often in his paintings, there is a subtext of the male gaze and uh, the male gaze over maybe female privileges. With Anthony Van Dyke, Van Dyke is a, uh, a painter in England for Charles I. He's the official painter for Charles and his court. He is creating a... Uh, um, he is all about idealizing and grandizing the features of the aristocracy. So we always see them well-dressed. We always see them in really interesting places and really interesting scenes. In me, for many ways, he might be the least interesting of many of our artists here. Charles V is the Holy Roman Emperor at the time in 1519 of the Spanish Empire. And besides his military endeavors, he's best known for opposing the Protestant Reformation. He also is a patron of the arts, as is Philip IV, who Diego uh, Velazquez is painting for in his court. Perhaps one of the great paintings of all time is Las Meninas, the Maids of Honor. We are looking at a massive painting, and the Infata, the, uh, the, um, the heir to the throne, she is surrounded by her attendants, uh, including a dwarf, her dog. There is her official bodyguard checking in on her, and we see Velazquez working on this massive painting assuming probably this is the painting that we are actually seeing. Now, why is that so important and so amazing? Now, you know, it's okay and it's well done and I always love his techniques, but it's the mirror in the background that I find interesting here. In the background, we are seeing an image of the king and the queen, the mother and father of this child. And if you notice them in the mirror, where are they in the painting? They are not in the painting. So who is everybody looking at? They are looking at the king and the queen. And again, we see the reflection here. Well, where are we looking at the painting? We are looking at the position where the king and the queen would be. So what Velazquez has done here is he momentarily has turned us as viewers into the king and the queen. We are all king and queen for a moment as we view this painting. And I find that to be really, really, really fascinating. Moving on to theater. So in theater, we are finding the birth of the opera. We are getting from Giovanni Gabrielli. We are getting dramatic polychoral, uh, instrumental religious music, abandoning a cappella, 
uh, the favor, the, the, the tradition in favor of Rome. Again, remember, they're not really into the instruments. And he is composing work for two or more choruses, almost like stereo two speakers, solo instruments, and that he is including trombones and coronets. And he is also in St. Mark's, where a lot of these concerts are happening. He has positioned on either side of the space for the clergy and the choir, choir two organs surrounding the altar. So he is creating different voice choirs, choirs on balcony, high above the nave, and also working in the motet, opposing and contrasting um, uh, seniorities senior, senior, known as con concerato. And this becomes the basic music of the Baroque era. So he is writing scores for the piano, which is soft and also loud to govern the dynamics of the loudness and softness of the piece. He is all about tonality, the arrangement of musical comp compositions around a central note called the tonic or the home tone. He is working in a keynote and then building off of the 12 tones from the seven white keys and the five black keys of the piano keyboard in chromatic scale. What does all of that mean? Well, let's look at a couple of things here first. And again, I can only show you a little bit lest um, uh, we get censored by, and by the way, if this video gets cut and I have to recut it and some of it gets cut, you know the reason why. So here's a little bit here of O Magnum Mysterium by Gabrielli. And again, notice the, the two choirs on either side here, stereo. So again, notice how the sounds are coming from both sides here. Now, in terms of musical notation being developed, this is a really great teaching tool to learn this very quickly. And again, I don't know how much of it I can show, but when I talked about the tonality and working in key notes, this is what this looks like. Is the organization of seven notes that sound good together. C major is a great key signature for us to look at because it uses all of the white keys on the piano. Let's check it out. If we look at all of the white keys starting from C, it will show us the major scale formula. The major scale is something you should memorize to make your musical life easier. The major scale is comprised of the whole steps and half steps that we covered earlier. Let's take a look. The half steps are the black keys. So again, if you want to learn more about this, check out the video. I think it's really, really useful. The other things that I have here in the music section uh, also include how musical notation looks, um, how to read it, and um, this is really a good primer for those of you who maybe don't know how to read musical notation but might be interested. So we are seeing a new notation that is developing here in the Baroque era. Opera. So the birth of opera. This is music drama of ancient Greek theater, Renaissance masks in the form of musical entertainment, including dance, poetry, rich costumes, and scenery. There is a case to be made that all of the arts are embedded in the opera. It's dramatically cohesive, more so than the Renaissance masks, and reviving the music drama of Greek theater. This is Monteverdi and his um, opera Orfeo. So in Orfeo, we have the liberato, 
the little book that is the text of the opera that would give you the classical theme. In Orfeo, we have a descent of Orpheus, the Greek poet musician, into Hades. He starts with instrumentals and an overture, and then the orchestral introduction of the opera. Then they also have uh, vocal music consisting of arias, solo songs or duets, alternating recitives, passages that are spoken or recited with sparse chordal accompaniment. And then also we have emphasis in shifts of mood and eventually the effects of uh, pizzicato, a plucked or stringed instrument. And so in Orfeo, and I'll show you again a little bit of it, I have the whole thing here performed, and I show you different uh, parts of it and the times that they show up. So Orfeo, he gets married, his wife dies, he is a great musician and has a heavenly voice, and using his voice in his musicianship, he is able to get into the land of the dead and convince the, um, the leader and convince um, Hades to release his wife and bring her back to the living. And this happens again from getting the rower of the river Styx to cross the river Styx. And then once he is able to retrieve her, there is a restriction. She can come back into the world as she follows him back into the world of, of the living. However, if he looks backwards to make sure that she is there, she will disappear forever. And of course that happens. He is distraught that he couldn't bring his life back. And then ultimately, because of the greatness of his voice, the gods invite him to come to heaven with him. And we're going to see the part where he ascends into heaven. And then after that, it ends with a lively kind of double-timed dance. And I'll show you just a little bit of the dance and a little bit of the ascension. Again, not sure how much of it Witwet can show. So again, this is going to lead into his ascension. She goes up with him, and then they are led away. You can see he has his string lyre with him in their duet. And up they go. And then it ends with a lively dance piece. Faster music. And again, lively little dance. So hopefully we get away with looking at that. And I explained the whole opera for you in these two slides. In the French opera, we have the father of the French opera in Jean-Baptiste Louis. And he is overseeing the musical phases. They are based on themes from classical mythology, once again, semi-divine heroes, and of course, flattering prototypes of your patron, the king. In George Friedrich Handel, we have the German Baroque. So Handel is creating instrumental works and his development of the oratorio. He is uh, like operas. Oratorios are large in scale and dramatic in intent, but unlike opera, they are performed without scenery, costume, or dramatic actions. His oratorios are essentially homophonic. That is, the music organization depends on the use of a dominant melody supported by chordal accompaniments. We probably know him best maybe from his, uh, his work here in Handel's Messiah. I think you'll recognize it quite quickly.
Okay. I don't know if we can get away with much more than that. There's the big hallelujah, hallelujah that I think maybe I started a little bit late. So also because um, we are looking at Johann Sebastian Bach and we are looking at another German, Bach, his major contributions are his Protestant roots in Martin Luther's teachings, uh, the organ, which is the principal instrument in the Lutheran church, and he is uh, adding the cantana, a multi-movement piece composed of texts sung by chorus and soloists, and he is also uh, recreating a mighty fortress is our God, which is uh, one of his famous uh, cantanas. It has an organ prelude and then congregational singing. And this is a little bit of it. You may remember we played this before. Our, um, our God is a mighty fortress. That is cantana 80. Here's a little bit of it from the UCLA choral. Notice the rich sound between all of the musicians and then also from all of the singers. The largeness of this is going to really culminate in Beethoven in the Romantic era, where we're going to have many, many more instruments, which means that it can get much louder and the range between really booming sounds and quiet uh, has more emotional impact upon us. Uh, listening to it. Now, pure instrumental music from Vivaldi. So, we have the now making of the harpsichord and the clavichord. I'll show you what the clavichord is. We're not going to see the modern piano for a little bit until we got um, stronger steel to make the more booming sounds inside of it. We also have from Vivaldi the Sonata and the, um, the Concerto, and, or I'm sorry, we, we get that in um, instrumental music. So three types of musical composition are the Sonata, which is a musical form written for unaccompanied a keyboard instrument or another instrument with a keyboard accompaniment, the Suite, written for any combination of instruments, and the concerto. And the concerto is opposing bodies of sound featuring two groups of instrument, one small, one large, playing in dialogue together. With Vivaldi. Vivaldi, we are also going to get an idea of program music. So program music is illustrating a story purely with instrumental music or illustrating a poem without any words. And I think the two links that you have to winter and to spring, my guess is you probably heard them both. Winter very much sounds like winter with um, ominous drums and in, or in ominous kind of strings. And then in uh, La Primavera, the spring, well, I guarantee you, you have heard this many, 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 many times before. Oh, and it looks like the it reset here. That means they are going to make us have a couple of commercials. I just queued it up before we started. So program music is going to become especially popular with romantic composers. The Four Seasons challenges listeners to detect the extra musical references. The brilliance of this piece lies in its vibrant rhythms and the virtuoso solos and the dialoguing happening uh, between the instruments. And I'm going to cue it up at the beginning because you're going to recognize it right away from the beginning. Right? 
So right away, and again, you can see how the piano and the keyboard is kind of leading the way. Uh, often you find that the piano is responsible. Uh, often the, um, the, the writer of the piece usually is figuring things out on the piano, kind of keeping the tempo alive. And then we have the soloists in the stringed instruments happening here. Last thing I want to share with you is what the clavichord sounds like. So the clavichord is a kind of early piano uh, before the stronger steel is going to make for the louder, louder sounds when the keys are struck. Right, a little tinny not quite as loud, not quite as robust as the piano, but we are seeing the basic instrument being designed, especially how the keyboard is operating in relationship to uh, tones and the notes. All right. So you, of course, are going to be doing the assessments. Make sure you number them. Make sure you are complete in your answers their essay style, do not be brief. And then you have an assignment, a longer, a long form assignment, where you're gonna watch videos and you're going to tell me about the different kinds of Baroque that we studied from the Baroque art. I also want you to uh, watch, um, a uh, take a tour, a, a three-dimensional immersive tour from Google Arts and Culture into the Palace of Versailles. And then also I have a small extra credit assignment. The documentary uh, Baroque from St. Paul, St. Peter's to St. Paul's is, is excellent, by the way. And what you can see here is the Spanish Baroque. And I want you to take a look at the mystical in Zuberan's paintings. All right, everyone. Talk to you soon. Looking forward to your thoughts and hope you enjoy the broke as much as I do. Bye-bye, everyone.